Margot Wallström, thank you for joining us to reflect a bit on progress made and obstacles that remain to achieve gender equality and the re realization of women's human rights. In 2014, as newly appointed Minister for Foreign Affairs, you launched Sweden's feminist foreign policy. How do you define a feminist foreign policy? It was an opportunity to define feminism and really about women and men being able to enjoy the same rights, opportunities and obligations and then to create the policies that enable this. And that sounds easy, but of course it's really about the implementation and how you turn this into a reality. And, and in what ways has, has this uh, feminist foreign policy made a difference in practice? Now it's been six years since it was launched. Well, um, I quickly realized that uh, I had to present the methods uh, to, uh, to being able to implement this through all our diplomatic representation around the world. So I um, introduced uh, the three parameters that all start with, with an R. So I said it's about rights, it's about representation, and it's about resources. And that was, of course, a, um, a chance to say that uh, when discussing rights, you have to look at the legal and human rights. Do women and girls enjoy the right to education, uh, the right to open a bank account or to start your own business, the right to not be uh, married when you are uh, 15, uh, and, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, when it comes to representation, that was of course about women uh, not having a seat at the table where important decisions are being made uh, about them, uh, about the, their lives and about their countries, the future of their countries. So it was really about political and economic representation. And finally resources, what about the, the budget? Um, do countries uh, have enough of the facts and statistics? Uh, do they have gender budgeting? Can we control that uh, money in the national budgets actually go to meet also the needs of, of women and girls? And that helped a lot because it's, it's very clear what is it that we should look at. But why does it belong to foreign policy? It's because more women means more peace. We know that um, when women are at the table to negotiate peace agreements, there are more options uh, on the table. And uh, those um, agreements that have women's signatures will actually last longer. So we have a better chance to, to uh, achieve sustainable peace if women are involved from the very beginning and in these peace processes. Right representation and resources. That's very clear. Uh, what would you say is the most important achievement to date uh, in your view? Well, I would say that to actually put this on the top of the Security Council's agenda. So uh, that means bringing it uh, to the international community and at the highest level uh, in the context of women, peace and security. That was something we we managed to do and by asking the question in every meeting so where where are the women are they mentioned in security council resolutions are they there as peacekeepers are they there to brief the security council etc and i think we have tangible results uh, uh, after after these years of course there was a lot of, of interest also around the world and uh, we got a lot of attention and also followers i think that this has become part of, uh, of the way uh, we think about uh, women and men being affected differently both in war and peace. Uh, so I, I think we, we achieved also um, bringing a lot of attention to these, uh, to these issues and we of course also trained women mediators and negotiators uh, so that um, we, didn't, we didn't want to hear again the argument that uh, there are no women uh, mediators. Yes, there are. And what would you say is the greatest obstacle? Well, we knew that uh, this uh, would become a controversial concept and uh, you know, the, world, the word feminism comes with a negative connotation in, 
in, uh, in many countries. But I must say that quickly turned into a lot of enthusiasm also from all our embassies and, and ambassadors and uh, more of a curiosity. And I think that since we also um, have delivered so many practical results, because what we did was to turn this into a yearly action plan. And uh, for example, we had the priority to um, sexual and reproductive health and rights. Uh, we had a campaign um, with midwives for, for all. Uh, so of course, helping uh, women to, to give birth and, and uh, promote their, their health. Uh, everything that we have done aims at making sure that women can enjoy fully uh, sort of the legal and, and human rights that uh, that men do and uh, I think that this has both saved lives and we have really changed the reality and with an exhibition that we had also called uh, Swedish Dads we we um, encourage countries to actually introduce uh, uh, parental leave so that uh, also men could uh, stay home with with their newborn kids a fantastic yeah. exhibition. I've actually, I've actually displayed it at workshops and, and trainings we've had in, in Asia and it always receives such a positive uh, reaction both from men and women. Absolutely and I think one should never estimate the power of culture also because the, we, we need to discuss also the different roles that men and women are given in, in society. But to me this is, this is really also about making sure that women uh, play fully uh, the role that they should be given when it comes to, to war and peace and uh, ensuring um, a durable peace in, in, in their countries. Uh, and I think that um, that's something we have to continue to in, insist on and in saying that this will help any peace process because you can look around the world and the ongoing conflicts and uh, you will notice that uh, women are still uh, basically absent from many of these uh, discussions. Did you first become engaged in, in so-called women's issues, as, as they were called back then, uh, and, and feminism? Well, um, uh, to me it's a matter of both democracy and uh, equality. And I think that I first, of course, um, took this on also professionally when I was uh, uh, appointed as, as minister for gender equality uh, early on. It was part of my portfolio that had also many other things, but, but that um, made me sort of set my own agenda. And to this day, these, um, these, those sort of that agenda is still valid because it's about uh, uh, having equal pay for equal work. It's about, uh, we call it daddy come home, meaning that we should discuss also the role of, of men in the family and in, in society and towards uh, children, raising children. Uh, it was about uh, getting rid of violence against women. And it was about women's representation in uh, political affairs and in, in society. So we are still on that, uh, on that track and still on that same agenda. So I think that made me engage in, in these issues uh, early on. What's the most memorable International Women's Day you've experienced? Well, that, that's, it's difficult to choose um, one, but um, I must say that uh, I worked uh, for the United Nations as a special representative on conflict-related sexual violence. And I think that those two years uh, and the travels that I made to war and conflict zones, meeting with many of the survivors of, of sexual violence, that has really made an impression on me that will stay with me. I, I often say that it, it created nightmares, but, but also um, paradoxically maybe a uh, new hope for the world, because uh, I really think it is for, for women to, to uh, come forward. And the 8th of March uh, is uh, an opportunity to both show that we have a long way still to go, but maybe also take a step back and look at the achievements because a lot 
has happened thanks to women who fight uh, together with, with women all around the world. And look at the pandemic. I mean, as much as it is a common experience uh, by now, a uh, global common experience uh, of being exposed to a pandemic, uh, the, the consequences are very different. And women, unfortunately, seem to face the, the toughest consequences and, and the hardest uh, things to suffer. So not, not least violence uh, against women. It shouldn't have to be like that, and we have to change it. And that's why this is important also for the world as, as we know it, uh, for maintaining democracy and, and equality uh, and so on. Uh, and that's our, our role for, for now and for the future. On a more uh, personal level or non, non-professional level, uh, I, I assume you've experienced your share of, of patriarchal power structures and sexism and misogyny, how, how do you deal with it uh, at, at a more individual level? Well, I, I think you have to um, seek support um, and assistance from, from, from sisters and, and also wise men who understand what is, what is going on. You have to have, find friends and you have to build networks to get uh, support and to be able to, to discuss and share some of, of these experiences. And so t- to me, that is uh, very important. And of course, if you can recognize some of these uh, methods of uh, um, oppression, you can uh, deal with them uh, easier uh, also because you can see how men sometimes try to belittle us or they try to to take away the attention or they try to... There there are many ways to uh, show uh, the power um, structure and to, of course, many men want to maintain the the existing power structure and you have to maybe learn uh, to see those uh, structures and those uh, methods also being uh, used in everyday life and it will be uh, easier to find a way to answer to you. And the final question uh, that I wanted to ask you is which women and, and men have inspired and supported you most? <laughs> it's difficult to choose uh, a name, uh, just a, a few, because uh, um, I mean, I've had a, a rather long political career and I can say that somebody like Ingvar Karlsson, who was the then prime minister, is uh, maybe one of the best uh, sort of both bosses and, and leaders that I have seen. And very few men dare to, like he did, say that these are the new young um, the colleagues that I have chosen uh, and appointed to different uh, posts in my, my government, they will take over. And I want to help them, I want you to help them and, and train them in the best possible way. And he gave room and space and opportunities to, to us who were then young ministers. And I think that that's a, an admirable way of, of uh, uh, acting as a leader. And uh, I've said that, you know, that's true leadership, but that's a relation. Uh, being a manager is a position and you have to be able to, to separate those, those two. But we also have to be aware when we see so many of these autocrats now um, um, pushing for more power and uh, they are indeed very, very dangerous. Uh, So women have to stand up to this and we have to organize ourselves and we have to work to change also the everyday life for women because feminist foreign policy to me has always been a very practical policy. It's not a motto, it's a policy that should be pursued and implemented throughout and in through all our embassies and a diplomatic representation, but also in the way we think about about the world, that it's really about changing changing policies and changing laws, and making sure that the rights and representation and resources also go to meet the needs of women and girls. Thank you very much, Margot Falster. Thank you, and good luck.